Ongoing efforts to get more girls and young women studying STEM disciplines, that is, science, technology, engineering, and math, have paid off in recent years. Enrollment and graduation rates are up, yet the number of women in the STEM workforce in Canada has barely budged in the past generation. Here to help walk us through what's going on and what might help, we welcome rocket scientist Nally Panic. Ah! <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to you. I've been following you on Instagram, and I think what you're doing is amazing. Thank you. Um, so I was reading about you. You interned at NASA. You have your pilot's license. Yeah. You're a rocket scientist. Yet, you've said, and I quote, um, your greatest challenge has been self-doubt in my skills and capabilities. Why is that? I think just growing up, even though I had this long-term dream of wanting to travel to space and I loved and was very good at the maths and sciences, it was constantly a challenge to keep up my confidence and believe that I fit in with male-dominated projects and feeling like I had something to give and contribute. So that's something I'm constantly getting over even to this day. Is it because, like you said, you were one of few women in the rooms or what other people said? I don't think it was so much what other people said, just that because I was one of the few women in the room, sometimes the only woman, I often felt like I was out of place or like I didn't belong there. So I was constantly proving my worth and proving like I had the skills to be there. How did you get into engineering and robotics? Because I wanted to travel to space and be an astronaut, I was constantly researching other astronauts and what they had done in their careers, and a lot of them were engineers. I also had an amazing physics teacher in high school who showed me the rewards of a career based on engineering and science, so that's how I got into it in the first place. What is it about space that interests you? I think it's the unknown, not knowing what's out there, and then also the opportunity to see Earth from a different perspective, and mm -hmm. what that different perspective can bring to affecting our lives here on Earth in a more positive way. Now, getting your internship at NASA was quite challenging. You didn't give up. How did that internship come about? So it was a space exploration scholarship through the Canadian Space Agency, and they send one Canadian student down to NASA to intern for a summer. And I ended up applying for it four times, was rejected all four times that I applied, and was so frustrated after that fourth rejection that I decided just to call the chief of the Office of Higher Education at NASA myself, just to get feedback on my application, find out what I could be doing to get more aerospace experience. Mm -hmm. And then on that phone call, I ended up getting offered the internship position. Were you shocked? Were you surprised? I was definitely shocked. I thought I was going to get a voicemail, so I had my whole little bit rehearsed of what I was going to say. When that conversation ended, I was also told I had to find $10,000 to cover the program <laughs> fee. So it was even more to persevere and get through after getting that position. But had you not called and had you taken no for an answer, it wouldn't have happened. And it was one of the most rewarding summers of my life, being surrounded by people working on actual stuff that's in space now. Now, you've said before that um, you didn't like talking about that particular story. Yeah. But now you do. Um, why is it important to share stories about failure? I think often we don't always hear about the stories about people failing, especially in social media, Twitter, Instagram. Lots of times people put their perfect selves forward, mm -hmm. talking about only their successes and what they've accomplished. And the real world's not like that. We often fail. Things never go according to plan. And we have to learn how to improvise and get past those obstacles. And I think that's really important for young people to hear. The first time I told that story to a, an all-girls school, they said that they probably wouldn't even have tried a second time if they got rejected. So to hear someone saying that it took four times and it wasn't even on the fourth time that they made it kind of resonates and maybe triggers to them that it's OK to be rejected and fail on your first, second, third, and fourth, fourth time. time. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you hear someone say that, um, do you wonder what pushed you to apply four times, and also to take the initiative of calling and to try to find out why. What is I, it about you? I think I just didn't want to live with any regrets. I thought after I had applied those four times and got rejected, whoever was rejecting me on the other end probably hasn't given me a second thought to this day or wondered what I'm doing. But I have to live with the knowledge of whether I've done everything I possibly can to achieve my goals. What are some of the projects that you're working on now? So uh, right now, I'm on a Mars rover program. So the European Space Agency is sending a rover to Mars in 2020. And we're building the chassis and locomotion system. So that's basically what the base that? structure of uh -huh. the rover with the legs and the wheels that allows it to drive around on the planet and steer. 
That is so cool. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about more about what's happening in STEM. Mm -hmm. um, take a look at some numbers and some percentages. Um, and um, so women account for 39% of STEM graduates, which isn't bad, but it's not great when you compare that to graduates of all other degrees where women account for 66%. When it comes to actually working in STEM fields, women only make up 22% of the workforce. We've also got a graph comparing how much men and women in STEM careers make. Women are in red, uh, men are in blue, and these numbers are from 2010, the latest year available. Do you have any theories on why this continues to be a problem? I think it's definitely a complicated question. You'll mm -hmm. see the stats that you read there about how some universities have record enrollment of women going into engineering and the sciences. And I think that's great, but you need to look at it with a wider lens. Mm -hmm. So it's about inspiring the young women to go into the careers in the first place, getting them to go into the degree and then graduate. And then once they're in the workforce, keeping them in the workforce, moving them up to director level, board level, and management positions. And somewhere along the way, there's that leaky pipeline where you're losing women in the field after they've graduated with their degrees. And I think a lot of it's almost a death by a thousand cuts. All those little things of having to work twice as hard to get half as far that just add up and take its toll over time. And why is it important to focus on successes rather than obstacles? I think we need a balance of both. Mm -hmm. We definitely need to t put resources in place and have young women understanding the obstacles that are there. but. Sometimes I say it's like if I were going on a first date with someone, mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you all of my flaws right off the bat. I'm going to try and impress you first. Mm -hmm. And I think we need more women out there in the media um, talking about why we love what we do, why we love working in tech, and how our projects are creating meaningful and positive change in our communities. Why is it important for you to talk about your work? For me personally, mm -hmm. it was hard growing up not knowing what the path was, not knowing how to be an astronaut. And I keep thinking, oh, it would be so easy if I could have just emailed an astronaut or emailed Roberta Bondar mm -hmm. to see what to do. And so by putting myself out there, sharing my stories, mm -hmm. creating a blog, it's a space where young people can connect with me or just shoot me an email and ask me anything about scholarships, about engineering. And mm -hmm. we live in this amazing society where everything is connected and we can share information instantaneously. And I think it's a valuable way to gain momentum in women in STEM? Um, I've read about a lot of women who put themselves out in public and they face negativity. Has that been the case for you? I think I've been one of the lucky few who mm -hmm. hasn't encountered that, but my voice certainly doesn't speak for all. And there's many women who have faced trolls online and constant harassment and how to overcome that. I'm not sure. <laughs> if you find out, tell me. Yeah. <laughs> um, what would you say to women who feel hesitant about putting themselves out there? I would say that it's natural. Mm -hmm. Everybody feels like that. I have certainly felt fear and vulnerability at almost all stages of my career. But if you can get over that initial discomfort, there are so many great learning opportunities mm -hmm. and ways to push your limits and your capabilities. And you, we were talking before we started taping about when you met Roberta Bondar, who's your role model. Yeah. As, um, and you do a lot of public speaking at schools. What is the message you share with kids? We're we'll probably looking at you in that same light. Yeah, I, just to dream big and mm -hmm. take risks and constantly look for opportunities to work outside of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Young people are the future, and our world is desperately in need of new perspectives and positive ways to transform the way we live and work. And what kind of response do you get from these talks? Oh, uh, positive energy, yeah. kids that are excited about I mean, look at me, I'm all giddy. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes young people just don't even realize yeah. all the amazing careers that are out there and things that they can do. And so simple conversations like this ignite a spark. And now, if someone is watching, um, I'm not sure they would know exactly what it takes to become an astronaut. Can you go through the steps of how you can become an astronaut? Sure. So agencies like the Canadian Space Agency would put out a call for astronauts whenever they're hiring uh, new recruits. Mm -hmm. And then you would need either a PhD or three years work experience in fields like science, engineering. And then this year, they opened it up to doctors, dentists, and nurses as well. And then, So as long as you're in STEM? Yes, yeah. STEM careers. And then things like having a scuba diving license, pilot's license, having experience uh, in more than one G, all those little things, like speaking other languages, uh, kind of beef up your application. And then if you happen to be what they're looking for, you might go to space. And you can fly. I mentioned it earlier, right? Yeah. <laughs> you can fly. I uh, 
took an internship during my third and fourth years of engineering, uh -huh. and the job I was working in wasn't really what I wanted to do, so I decided to make the most of my time by going to ground school and learning how to fly a plane. <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah. What kind of plane can you fly? Just like a small single engine aircraft, Cessna 172. Um, do you hope for one day to, for there to be a 50-50 split in the STEM fields? Absolutely. If that's like the I norm? that's everybody's dream, to have those diverse perspectives of mm -hmm. people in cross-disciplinary um, endeavors telling a bigger story. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so it's much for having me. It's been a pleasure me. speaking to you. Thanks. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit tvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.